Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Mediating Scale Conference once again for those who weren't able to join us earlier. My name is Oliver Kenny, and I'm delighted to be chairing this session, our second keynote presentation with uh, Joshua DeCalio. Just a bit of housekeeping. Please note that the session is being recorded. After the main presentation, we will have roughly half an hour of discussion. So please post your questions in the Q&A box um, at the bottom, and uh, we'll try to put as many of them as we can uh, to our speaker at the end. Please try to formulate your questions concisely, and please make sure to use that, that feature, the Q&A feature, rather than, than putting them uh, in the chat. So I'll bring in our speaker. So this is Joshua DeCalio. Uh, Joshua's research is focused on the philosophical and rhetorical underpinnings of scale, whereby we conceive of reality as simultaneously atoms, galaxies, cells, bodies, ecologies, and quarks. Uh, he is assistant professor of English at Texas A&M &A University. He is author of Scale Theory uh, with the University of Minnesota Press from last year, uh, which you're able to access either on our website or uh, here on Zoom, just the first part of it. And he is working on two follow-up projects to this, one called Lithium, an experiment in scalar relations, and another book called Scales of Influence or Rhetoric After Information. We're delighted to have him here with us, uh, for us this evening, for him uh, sometime in the middle of the day. Uh, and today he's going to be giving a talk entitled Scale Changes Everything, an Introduction to Scale Theory. And with that, over to you, Josh. All right. Thank you, Oliver. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and put us over there. OK. All right. I'm going to keep myself on time here. All right, so uh, first off, I did want to say uh, thank you for the uh, generous invitation. Thank you guys for uh, coming to uh, see this. Um, and also thank you to the previous speakers, uh, both to Zach uh, and Yazdin, Sarah and Christian. Uh, I really enjoyed hearing you guys' talks. And I'm going to try to actually integrate some responses and thoughts in relation to what you guys said uh, as we go. Um, you know, I, I should in particular acknowledge Zach uh, uh, um, it's it's a wonderful thing. Uh, I think it was about ten years ago that he and I had a conversation before we wrote our dissertations about the need for a theory of scale itself, apart from any discipline. Um, and it's a wonderful thing to see. Then you know, almost ten years later, our books come out within three months of each other, um, and we both have talked about how strange that is to happen during the pandemic. So an extra thank you to Oliver and to Magdalena for organizing this excuse to actually talk about the things that we've been working on for, for the last 10 years. Um, and, you know, Zach and I's paths have crossed a few more times since then, uh, but this is, this is the first time that he and I have really uh, been able to compare the, the final products. Um, and so uh, it's been super interesting already, um, and I look forward to continuing to talk about these things with you all, okay? So uh, the talk today, as, as Oliver said, is uh, scale changes everything. Uh, an introduction to scale theory. Now, as dramatic as that is, and I know people love to claim that their topic changes everything, there's an actual reason that I call it that. Um, and it has to do with the basic premise of the project. So bear with me, uh, and we're gonna, we're gonna explain actually why, uh, why that's an appropriate title, okay? Now, as Oliver said, this comes out of uh, my book, which was published out of University of Minnesota Press last year. Uh, you're welcome to use this code to get 40% off. Uh, I, I'm actually unclear whether or not this will work outside the United States, but you can give it a shot and see. Um, and uh, in, in addition, uh, you can, as, as Oliver said, read part one for free, uh, either through the Media and Scale website or at my website. I've got it there as well. OK. Um, OK, so uh, so I, I'm going to basically talk through uh, both the premise of the project, uh, the book Scale Theory, but also, of course, talk about scale theory more generally as an idea uh, and as a, a point of concern, which of course is why we're all here. Um, so I'm very happy to talk through some of this. Now, Oliver's uh, bio of me already gave away some of the provocation here, uh, but the basic premise that I have been working with um, in, in engaging with scale uh, is, is a, a, a kind of transformation of the world that I find endlessly bewildering, okay? How is it possible that the world or the cosmos or whatever is can simultaneously be conceived as atoms and cells, uh, objects that we live along like leaves, uh, whole planets and galaxies and all at the same time. 
right? And that simultaneity is important. Uh, we can certainly talk about that uh, as we go forward. Okay. And so that's one of the basic provocations here is like, how is it possible that all of these different objects exist at the same time at all of these different scales? What then is scale that makes it possible to trace out these differences? Okay. But that's actually incomplete as a provocation because to make this really work uh, as, a, as a mode of inquiry, to really understand and start to trace out what scale has done already to our way of speaking and thinking uh, and relating to the world, we need to actually start from here, which is this guy in the middle at the scale of here. I happen to even be wearing the same shirt that was intentional. Um, how is it possible that I am simultaneously atoms and cells and pieces of a planetary ecology or even minute dis, uh, elements in the dispersal of galaxies? Okay, and once you insert that transformation, not just into external objects that you can kind of comfortably be apart from, then you get this more, I would argue, radical reorientation to the cosmos, okay? Uh, so the point of scale theory then was to take this on directly um, and to think as carefully and slowly and as thoroughly as possible about what this transformation is, how we might say something about how we got here and how we might start to untangle what it's done to our conceptions of the cosmos, okay? Now, a really useful place to start, and it's actually really useful in relation to where Zach already started with us uh, this morning, is to actually ask the question, well, why has it been hard for us to clarify a theory of scale? Uh, because I think that actually says something then about what I mean by a theory of scale and the difficulties that we find ourselves launched into. Uh, and so this is a good place for me to start to talk about both why I ended up writing this book and also untangle some of the confusing notions of scale and problems associated with it, okay? So why has it been hard to clarify a theory of scale? The first two are actually historical reasons, all right? The first one is that this layer schema that I just worked through in this provocation, uh, insofar as we wanna say it's been discovered and elaborated by science, is far newer than we would like to think. And the best example I can give of this is, uh, I was just completely astonished in the middle of this project discovering that cell theory had only been uh, uh, put forward in the 1850s, and it took a while after that to be ac accepted. Um, and as I started to look at all these different you know, aspects of the sciences and technologies of scale, it became clear actually that most of uh, these kind of scalar objects and this kind of scaled view of the cosmos I wanna talk about was really a, a product of, of the, the 19th century in certain ways, right? We have evolution not until the 1860s, periodic table isn't fully developed out until the 19, uh, 1869. And then of course, even going smaller than the atom, which was supposed to be uncuttable, you have to go into the 20th century. And then if we're even gonna talk about the ability to really see in some kind of vision way, the earth as an object, we, had, we have to go into the 1960s uh, to actually get that uh, uh, image or view of, of, of Earth from space, right? So it, it seems to be actually not a small thing that this layer schematic that I'm talking about is far newer than we would like to think, right? People like to say, well, Robert Hooke discovered animalcules, as he called them, or cells uh, a long time ago, uh, 1665, I believe, was the micrographia. But we're going to talk a little bit about why, well, okay, there's still some extra stuff had to happen before we start to get this vision of scale I wanna talk about, okay? The second historical reason is then to say, okay, yes, but the precedents in terminology and the philosophical questions actually emerge from other modes of inquiry other than science, right? And so what's happened is that even though this kind of change of scale uh, or the schematic of scale I just talked about in relation to these kind of scientific objects, cells, atoms, galaxies, and so on, um, even though they're related very heavily to science, the terminology and philosophical questions uh, and the forms of rhetoric uh, emerge from other modes of inquiry. As we've already seen in our discussion today, one of those is political theory, right? Um, and so, for instance, the notion of the body politic, uh, and uh, this is, uh, you might recognize this as a part of uh, Hobbes' uh, Leviathan frontispiece, right? Um, these all contain assumptions about scale. They develop terminologies that seem scalar, right? Um, but yet, it's unclear how they relate to these scientific modes of scaling that, uh, that the provocation deals with, right? Um, and of course this goes, you know, we can trace this back a long way in terms of, of, of the uh, philosophy of political theory, right? Uh, the other one that I add though, there's certainly others you could add uh, in art and other forms of discourse, uh, 
but the other mode of discourse that I engage with heavily in the book is actually mysticism, okay? Um, and so, and, and the reason for this is that the more that I was trying to uh, find where do, where do scientists especially start talking about the implications of this scalar schematic that they have made of the cosmos, every time, nearly every time, maybe we shouldn't be that equivocal, but nearly every time, they, they start switching discursive registers to something more like a mystical form. In fact, people will then dismiss them as being really mystical or something like that. Oh, Carl Sagan, your prime example, is no longer very scientific. He sounds really mystical when he starts talking about the cosmos, right? And so instead of shoving that to the side, I end up in the book actually integrating it in as another form of discourse, redefining mysticism in terms of scale um, and talking about it with great detail. Okay, now I'm not going to talk about it in great detail here. Instead, I'm going to substitute some of those questions about mysticism with what I'm going to call just rhetorical considerations, which is the actual transformation of your perspective that scale might bring. Okay, and there's, I, I, I talk pretty at length in the book about why they're related, uh, but I'm just going to kind of make that switch here. Welcome to talk about these mysticism connections uh, and, and the ways in which I ground them. Oh, but I should give you a quick example in relation to the pol political theory and mysticism question, because the best example that I have is the, uh, the word hierarchy, um, which we associate with political theory, of course, um, is, is uh, uh, most certainly uh, uh, coined by Pseudo Dionysius uh, to talk about the, the layers of heaven. Uh, that was one of the examples that I encountered that, I, that made, made it clear that I needed to actually take these texts seriously and think about what they were as a, as a mode of discourse for talking about changes, these, these radical changes of the world uh, uh, alongside science and other forms of rhetoric, okay? Or, or thinking or speaking, all right? Now, the, re the rest of these reasons that it's been hard to clarify a theory of scale are more philosophical, okay? And some of these we've already encountered in some of the other talks, uh, especially in Zach's. Uh, the third thing is that there's a confusing relationship to objects. Now, there's something very specific I want to talk about here because it has to do with, with what Zach already mentioned is uh, the, the disciplinary problem of scale, right? That ecologists are going to deal with certain objects. Biologists are going to deal with certain objects. And humanists are going to deal with certain objects as we already have done with these novels and uh, thinking about the experience of reading a novel, okay? But the main thing I want to highlight in terms of this confusing relationship to objects is that a lot of our early notions of scale are of this sort, right? Gulliver's Travels, Alice in Wonderland getting smaller and bigger, depending on how you, you drink a potion. Of course, we've got the more sort of recent ones in film uh, and uh, both small and large, there's the Fantastic Voyage, right? Now, the thing that we want to note about all of these that's very different than that original provocation is that they assume an object, right? Notice how you know, three of the four here are people uh, and the fourth one is, is uh, you know, similar to us, uh, uh, ape getting much, much larger, okay? And so I actually separate this out very early in the book as what I call Gulliver's scaling. Presupp that we, and, and, and it can be defined as this, presupposing an object and keeping it intact even as you make it larger or smaller, okay? Um, no, there's two really important uh, uh, versions of this that aren't really tied to like fiction, like Gulliver's, uh, and that's scalability in the business sense. So you may be familiar with uh, the anthropologist Anna Singh has written an essay called Non-Scalability on non-scalability. It's also a part of her, her mushroom book uh, in which she critiques scalability in this sense in relation to environmentalism. Uh, and I'm, I'm completely on board with that, uh, that critique of Gulliver's scaling. Right, um, and so part of what I'm doing is separating out what I also call scale itself, uh, much like Zach does, from these problems of Gulliver scaling, because you notice in relation to that provocation, what is not transformed in this form of scaling is those objects. We imagine, and that's why it's wholly imaginary, that they can get larger and smaller. And in fact, that's what biology essentially discovers. And so there's this famous essay on being the right size by uh, the biologist Hal Dane from, I think it was the 1920s, um, in which he notes that you can't indefinitely get larger or smaller as an organism, that there's actually a right size for any given organism. Uh, okay, uh, so it seems to me that that is actually putting pressure on this idea of Gulliver scaling, this idea that one could be an object and get really big or really small without changing form, okay? Then there's a confusing relationship to knowledge. What do I mean by this? I mean specifically that we've spent all of this time getting knowledge about, uh, let's start with scalar objects, right? Like we define a cell, we spend all of this time talking about what cells are, or DNA, right? 
we, we figure out what DNA is, or heaven forbid, a coronavirus. And we spend all of this time talking about the scalar objects, trying to understand what they are uh, and, and what they do. Um, that, I would argue, does not clarify the role that scale plays in getting to that object in helping us understand what, in the, under what conditions we have come to understand that object, okay? And then, uh, you know, one step better perhaps is to say, well, let's talk about what exactly happens at the nanoscale. This is pivotal to early discourse around nanotechnology, for instance, right? What is particularly useful about the nanoscale or particular about the nanoscale? But again, knowing things about the nanoscale itself doesn't necessarily clarify what exactly we mean by nanoscale. How do we get there? What does that do to our perception? How, how, do, how does that whole schema whereby we could conceptualize the nanoscale, how do we get to that? What does it do, okay? And actually, my, my, you know, let's go back to my favorite example about cell theory and say, I would actually argue that that's what the gap is between Hooke's micrographia and the cell theory. There's a couple of things. One is necessary resolution changes in microscopes. Uh, but, but another one is that it, that it requires this conceptual shift in which cells are not just very small compartments of an object, but actually some kind of form that's, that's, that's crossed the scalar threshold, okay? Now, I'm not gonna say anything more about that. It's gonna become clearer as we go, but there's in that gap, I'm saying, is the, the, the problem of scale itself, okay? Now, the last one, which I think, you know, Zach has covered pretty thoroughly, uh, is, is that there's a confusing relationship to representation. Uh, and, uh, and, and let me give you a few examples of this from my perspective. Uh, one is that you can put up an object like this and ask, hey, how big is this object? And if we're honest with ourselves, depending on how big your screen, it's probably, I don't know, like five centimeters across, right? And yet we're like, no, no, we know that this is Jupiter and Jupiter is, I believe, uh, 139,822 kilometers, give or take, right? So we say, oh, that's how big this object is. But then of course, what are we, what are we saying, right? Because it's not that big, it's only about 10 centimeters. And I could as just like a, a gotcha say, hey, no, this is actually a micro droplet at the micro scale uh, of some liquid suspended in a water. And that's what I've taken an image of here. And I made you think it was Jupiter, right? What is it that scale does to help us orient to what this object is and how big it is, okay? So there's a real confusing relationship as I think, you know, Zach is already pointing to a lot of this um, between what you're seeing here and to what does it refer and in what way, okay? So that's one layer of this. Uh, another layer, which I'm sure many of you have been thinking a lot about is what's the relationship then between this scalar relation between like, hey, this is a planet, this is our planet, um, and all the forms of framing, filtering, and overlaying that we do in relation to that once we have it as a representation, right? And Google Maps is the prime example of this or, or any kind of mapping software, right? You can already see we've inserted all sorts of layers in terms of lines and points of interest and so on, okay? Um, now, I'm ultimately not going to talk about that very much, but what, uh, uh, what I am going to talk about is how the theory of scale itself that I'm trying to talk about is, it requires us to both acknowledge these things, but also look for a theory of scale itself apart from this, and so I'm going to define it as cartographic scaling. And so I separate this out alongside Gulliver scaling as kind of parallel phenomenon that are related to scale. But this theory of scale itself puts pressure on these cartographic scalings and these Gulliver scalings, okay? Um, and so I'd actually argue that like many things, I think Zach and I would agree on, uh, a lot of that has to do with uh, a kind of emphasis on cartographic scaling, um, uh, perhaps. And, and maybe he and I should hash that out more thoroughly uh, in a more of a dialogue at some point, okay? Um, but here's the thing that I wanna really point us to in relation to, in, in separating out cartographic scale. Uh, I keep thinking about how depictions of ch changes in scale do not always capture the strangeness of that transformation. And here's what I mean specifically, and this is really important to the whole project. Scale introduces us to views that are both outside of our experience. And let's you know, take this very seriously, right? Like when we talk about cells and viruses, right? Coronavirus could be here as we speak. Heaven forbid, don't say that, right? Uh, well, you know, I'm starting to feel a little bit better about the world. Um, uh, but it's not in your experience, right? You don't experience cells or coronavirus uh, as a virus or as cells, right? I'm, you know, this is not cells, okay? Uh, and yet, and yet, it's not completely outside of our experience, right? Because actually, 
what science is saying is that this is cells. It's a lot of them, right? Uh, and in fact, we do want to say that what we have in experience is also that, is also cells, right? Coronavirus is both a virus and the effects that it has on your body and the pandemic uh, responses that we've been having for the last uh, two years or so, okay? Uh, so that seems to me really bewildering and worth really going carefully in terms of its scales relationship to the way that we speak about it, the way that we represent it, and how it's possible for us to do that, okay? Now, the last one then is to tie it back to the problem of observation. You might notice in what I just said that it was already about observation, okay? So in these changes of scales, humans are, in a certain sense, observing beyond themselves. So it's not that they're not observing it, but they're observing the world in a way they don't usually observe it, okay? And in order to, to see things like cells or viruses or climate change or the observable universe. Of course, we can't actually observe that. Um, and so it's really important then that this is, that scale pre presents us with a kind of traceable transformation of both our perspectives and ourselves, okay? And along with that, it has already, and it's really important that this, you know, I, I, heaven forbid I use the, the, the lovely thing that, that at least in America we've come to make fun of, uh, already, already, always already, right? Always already created a new language and practice and intervention, uh, um, which is to say, we talk about all of these scalar objects, we talk about these scalar relations, so it's already there, right? The transformation has already happened. How much do we understand it, right? How, do we, how much do we understand what has happened to us in this scalar schematic? And here's where the provocation for me really is, has your observation or experience been transformed when you think about these things? Because it already has, but does it really transform your conception? of the cosmos. And here's where actually I love uh, and insert Charles and Ray Eames' Powers of 10. Um, and, and this is actually where I think maybe, uh, you know, I, I wish Zach could respond to this at some point, uh, where uh, maybe me and Zach diverge a little bit because I love the Powers of 10. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about, about uh, why I, I like it a little bit going forward, but I actually have a whole separate article that I published that more directly addresses some of the things that Zach has pointed to. So I'll just put it there and say, you know, what, what seems to me really important to me about this schematic is the way in which it's, it, it puts us into this question of, do you realize that what is being transformed in here is your experience? Because it's really easy, as many people, Zach and otherwise, have said, it's really easy to imagine that there's just this external thing happening in this video screen, right? It's only when you look at your hand and go, oh my God, it is cells, right? these are ecological relations that you have started to transform your relationship to the cosmos according to these new relations that scale has, has traced out for us, okay? So just to summarize then, what I'm calling this theory of scale itself is one that's gonna account for that conceptual leap required to create that scale view of the cosmos and acknowledge these entangled discursive registers, right? Everything from mysticism to science to political theory and others and to, and to try to trace out how do we make sense of all these different ways of narrating uh, these transformations, okay? Without presupposing the objects described at any given scale, and that's both to, to set aside Gulliver scaling as a kind of fantasy, and also to acknowledge the kind of, what has to be ultimately the kind of, I, I like to call it non-disciplinary, um, maybe mainly because I, 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 uh, I don't know, it, it's not like I'm working across disciplines, I'm trying to think about scale, and that forces me to cut across all of these different discourses. Okay, because each of these discourses have certain scales that they're interested in um, and ways of, of, of narrating them. Okay, um, considering what scale does to our knowledge and how we gain knowledge about scales, while also acknowledging its relationship to representation. So I'm just summarizing what, it, what we just said, um, without considering a scale as a just a product of representation. And I think that's what, you know, Zach is trying to, to figure out how to do as well. Um, I think all of us, to some extent in this conference, uh, maybe, I shouldn't speak to everybody, but it seemed like one of the premises of this conference was to say, hey, what is the relationship between scale and these forms of knowledge, not just as a representation, but also as a representation, right? So yes, that's part of the project. Because, and, and ultimately for me, you know, I, I think one of the other things I was thinking about as I was listening to the other speakers is that um, 
is that in, in a certain way, my project is even more unmoored from representation uh, than some of what we've heard about already, but more tied to the problem of observation. Okay, so one, you know, I kind of uh, couch my sort of intellectual heritage into science and technology studies. Um, and so I've, I've done a lot of thinking about the problem of epistemology and science. So it's definitely part of the inquiry, okay? Now, uh, uh, Yazdan has already given my definition of scale. So, and he did a lovely job of, of running through the scalar schema there very quickly uh, and introducing the, the notion of logical types, which I wasn't planning on talking about. Um, uh, so I'm not going to talk about this definition here, but we're going to we're going to kind of see how some of the pieces of this come together as we go forward. Okay. Now, just a quick outline uh, so that you can see where what I'm doing right now in this talk fits in the rest of the book. Uh, what essentially happened in the process of writing this book is that, uh, well, strangely enough, uh, the first reader reports uh, for my book actually wanted me to be more theoretical. I, I, I you know, I've never encountered anybody else who has been told this, um, but I. I, I, I said I was going to make a theory of scale and they said, hey, make a theory of scale. And so I uh, had actually these thought experiments in the original draft, at least the first three. So I extracted them from the book uh, where they were before and put them in their own part, uh, which is part one, which is what I've made available to you. And it is by far the most axiomatic of the rest of the book. In fact, I, uh, as I'll talk about in a minute, uh, paragraph numbered them more or less. Um, and, uh, and yet, they're still experiential and that it's, it's their thought experiments rather than a series of statements, because I want to think about what scale has done to our mode of observation and kind of train the reader uh, in thinking in terms of scale, as I've been trying to, to grapple with it. Okay, so the first three chapters are these experiential origins of scale. And what do I mean by that? Well, how might we find ourselves with the need for something like a scalar reference? just within our normal experience. So like the, the first one's the easiest one, right? Go to a mountain or something else, you know, a long way from an object, suddenly that object gets smaller. How do we make sense of that? Um, okay, the second one is then what if we try to insert a measure to try to understand the relationship between what I'm experiencing up on the mountain and down there. The third one's a little bit more complicated. It has to do with accumulation of knowledge. Uh, although it's gonna be the most relevant for the conversation about, uh, about collective reading uh, that Yasin and, and uh, the others have put on the table, okay? Um, and, and out of those three experiential origins, I basically outline the basic parameters of scale so that then the next three thought experiments assume scale as an apparatus, as I'm thinking of it, and then, um, and then play with it. What can we do to play with it? And so what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to go through the last one, the, the, so the chapter six, the third thought experiment in scale, and then retroactively add back in things from the other experiments uh, to kind of outline uh, the theory more generally. Um, uh, for you all, okay. Um, now, the, the you know that that whole first part is only about sixty pages, right? And so there's a lot of statements in there. There's a lot of things that I come to, and I just state them. <laughs> and then, uh, and so I so then I have these other these other parts. Part two, which is also which is much more substantial uh, in terms of size, uh, that considers uh, the the way that scale reconfigures our relationship to first objects, second subjects, and then relations. Um, and this, these chapters are much more philosophical in a, in a certain way, but they also allow uh, certain kind of cultural narratives and depictions to come into the picture. So for instance, in the chapter on objects, I actually start with Philip K. Dick, the sci-fi writer. Um, and the reason I do that is because, uh, I, as I argue in the book, the reconfigurations of scale are not only ch like challenging philosophically, but they, they require such a reorientation that you almost have to couch it in terms of prolapsis, addressing of counter arguments, right? And so, uh, so I, I do a lot of analysis of both academic conversations, but also cultural objects to think about not only how to scale reconfigure our relationship to the cosmos, but also how we struggle with it uh, and, and try to think about it from that perspective, okay? And then because scale, as I've already indicated, brings into relation uh, things outside of our usual experience, it provides a, a, a particular uh, transformation in relation to representation. So even though part three, I think, is actually more relevant in certain ways uh, to, to what, uh, what many of you would be interested in, um, I'm, I'm not going to focus on it today, but you know it's there if you want to get the, the you know, in the weeds, as, uh, as Zach was saying, uh, if you want to really, really dig into uh, my, my arguments about representation and scale, uh, part uh, three has a chapter on science, 
a, a, a chapter that's more about representations directly. Uh, and so that one's gonna be really relevant to many of you. Um, and then uh, a, a somewhat enigmatic chapter, but one that I love about uh, uh, specifically contemplative inquiry that takes the premise of what if we were to imagine the cosmos reflecting back on itself, or if you prefer something like the brain reflecting on itself and conceptualizing itself as neurons or something like that, that there suddenly is a kind of rethinking of the problem of what we might call contemplative inquiry that scale can launch us into. Okay, so that's an outline of the whole book. Um, and uh, I'm happy to talk about any other portions that you guys would like, uh, but I'm going to be covering here uh, chapter six. Okay, now this chapter is called In the Scalar Simulation. Um, and you're gonna see those parenthetical notations uh, in this PowerPoint, and that's part of why I wanted to make the uh, rest of part one available. Uh, and I actually do this throughout the whole book is kind of cross reference back to part one. Uh, so we can see kind of how these I mean, that's why I call them algorithms, even though I know it's a metaphor, uh, because it's like, here's how they unfold in these other inquiries. Okay, these certain like principles, provocations and premises. Okay. So the premise of this thought experiment is really simple. Okay. Imagine that reality was capable of being fully represented in a virtual simulation in which one could pause all motion, zoom in and out, much like you can with Earth modeling software, except, and here's the crucial caveat, with as much detail as reality itself seems to produce. Okay, now this is obviously impossible. There's a million ways in which we can say this is impossible. And in fact, that's absolutely essential to the reason that I have this thought experiment and why I want to talk about it, because I think those limits also say as much about scale as anything, okay? So what I'm gonna do is make some initial observations. It's gonna fill in some principles about scale uh, that are from the other chapters. Then we're gonna talk about those limits and then we're gonna play with it just a little bit. Uh, and then I think we'll be at time, okay? So as uh, Zach already pointed us to, right? We're all familiar with something like Google Earth or other interfaces like this. Uh, what we're imagining here in the scalar simulation could look a little bit like this. Uh, although we want to imagine a little bit more closely to like a lot of like 3D video games, right? Where you can kind of, you know, uh, uh, move, a, move a perspective through uh, in various ways, okay? But there's some, some differences, right? Uh, we want to say that there's five dimensions, right? Up, down, right, left, forward, back. We can say a fourth dimension because why would we leave out time? We don't want to leave out time. And I can certainly address the relationship between scales of time and scales of space later. Um, uh, but there's uh, this, the, the crucial thing is that there's this crucial fifth dimension, just like you get in Google Earth, where you can change the scale at which you're perceiving the object, right? So uh, you get smaller, you no longer see Earth, you see cars or whatever. Uh, you, you know, maybe there's even a person walking around. Um, uh, except it's really important that unlike Google Earth, you can keep zooming in smaller than the meter so that we have something more like uh, what, what, what's in the powers of 10 or keep zooming out larger than the Earth. Okay, again, more like powers of 10. Um, and then we have again, this crucial caveat as information dense as the universe. So even though you know Google Earth as is often experienced doesn't have that much information when it comes down to certain places, right? If we were to zoom into uh, uh, Greenland up there, for instance, we might not see much going on uh, in the white section. I don't know, maybe there's, there, there would be more there than we would imagine. But uh, anyways, we would want it to be as information dense as the universe. So if you keep zooming in, if I were to find my, I find me and then I keep zooming in, I could see all of the cells in my hand or something like that, okay? Okay, so let's do our initial observations about the scalar interface, all right? So we're in the interface, there's the earth. At some point, zooming in, I can find me. Okay, and then continuing to zoom in, and I'm going to keep using the term zoom in for now, and then I'm going to replace it in a second uh, uh, because I because I acknowledge the the problems that Zach points to, and I actually don't really like the the term zoom in. So actually, maybe right now I will replace it with scale to the smaller. Okay, uh, because it's not actually a motion, right? We're changing our perspective so that we are now resolving. I'm already using my term. See, I get ahead of myself. Um, this person. And we could keep going and then now we don't see him anymore we see cells okay what is happening there is that changes in scale create a significant change in the objects observed okay um it's not just that uh that you get very small aspects of something right this guy does not exist here to be seen or exists here to be seen Okay, um, 
And, uh, and, and so this necessitates then the introduction of a couple of really crucial concepts. The first one is threshold, uh, which, is, which I define in, in this way. A discontinuity in what is observed, a change in the kind and quality of information that can be perceived as one alters the scale of observation. So as you change the scale of observation, suddenly you see and are able to resolve different things, right? Well, there I'm already using the term resolution. And actually my definition of resolution, I think is almost the exact same as X, right? Uh, the amount of detail that one can discern, discern within an observation. He was known as this too, right? You can keep zooming into my hand, but you're never going to see cells without a change in resolution, okay? And, and I guess the last point of this, the last part of this is the most important. Scale tracks the range of observation, while resolution points to the amount of detail able to be seen at that range, okay? What this allows us to do, as uh, Yazdim was already saying, uh, is define scale domains, okay? Um, and, and define them in this way. The range between thresholds of observation where the field of objects revises into an entirely new set of objects. You no longer see what you were seeing before. Different differences are able to be, to make a difference, okay? And I make a big deal out of that, uh, that definition. Uh, different differences that are able to make a difference. You might notice that that sounds a little bit like information theory, and I spent a lot of time talking about that in chapter seven, in case you want to know. Um, uh, but yeah, so scale domains, and, and as, uh, as Yazdin already uh, indicated, there's a surprisingly limited number of scale domains from this definition. There's the list again, and I do, for fun, basically, correlate them to size ranges in the metric system in a chart at, at uh, 513. Okay, uh, it's, it's uh, interesting to, to do. Um, okay, so significant changes in the objects observed when you change skins, all right? But here we have to really pause on this and notice that in our interface, we haven't touched any of the other controls. We haven't moved anywhere in a certain sense, okay? Uh, and we haven't changed time, okay? But we've changed that spatial scale and, uh, and changed the entirety of reality. Okay, so in a certain sense, in a certain real sense, we are observing the same thing, even when we're going down in scale or going up in scale. And I think this is where uh, Zach likes to talk about the, uh, 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 the book, uh, talking about the, the girl still being in the picture, right? This is, this is where I, we definitely overlap uh, on that front, okay? Um, and there, it seems to me that there are all of these strange corollaries that can come out of this. These are my favorite ones. The first one is that unity of seemingly separated objects can become available as a shift of perspective. Uh, and this is just, I, I want to point to this one because it shows us some of the ways in which a careful theory and scale just kind of blast aside some of our assumptions that we have about scale, um, right? And, and so this is directed, for instance, to a lot of political theory, uh, um, for instance, uh, Nancy Fraser's Scales of Injustice, uh, that seems to assume this kind of political notion that to unify, and she's critiquing this, I should be clear, uh, to unify is to, to force together, to make into a unified object, to homogenize in some way. When it seems to me that when you shift scales to the planet, you see an object, you didn't have to do anything. You didn't have to make them be the same or together into an object. It suddenly was available as a shift in perspective. Uh, you know, I, I'm not going to talk anymore about that, but it seems to me that these kind of changes in concepts are really significant. Okay. Uh, this one also is very important to me which is what is this thing that you're scaling, right? Which object, at what scale are you going to consider the thing it is that we're actually portraying in this scalar interface? If we scale out as, uh, you know, to as, as large as possible, right? Then it has to be the entire cosmos, all right? And so you are changing resolution on what? On the entire cosmos, okay? And again, I make a big deal out of this, talk about it pretty extensively in chapter seven, uh, and I address some of the kind of confusions that come out of that idea, okay? All right, and we're doing this change according to consistent, measurable, and traceable changes, okay? Uh, so let's break these down a little bit because here's where I start to address some of this problem with the smooth zoom. It's consistent, but logarithmic, log right? I mean, a lot of people point this out that it's, you know, it, it's, the, it's a consistent change because of the way that the measure works. So now I'm getting ahead of myself again. Um, but uh, yeah, it's consistent. So there is a consistent measure happening, um, but it's not quite a smooth zoom, right? It's not smooth at all, in fact, except that it's consistent, okay? Uh, and, and the reason it's not smooth is because of these scalar thresholds. Uh, 
that even though there's a consistent yet logarithmic change in the, the, the scale of observation, what is observed is by no means smooth, but rather radically alters into these different objects across scalar thresholds. Okay, it seems to me that that's very important. It seems to me that we've kind of moved, you know, missed that one uh, a lot of times when we say critique the powers of 10, okay? Here's the other thing, right, in relation to this question about arbitrary nature is, as I talk about pretty extensively in chapter two in that thought experiment, uh, the measure is not entirely arbitrary once selected. Uh, I mean, you don't wanna pick a cell or a planet to start your, your scalar measure with, um, but, but once you select a, a, an object, like I could use this mice, this mouse or this phone if I want to, um, you know, so that is arbitrary somewhat, okay? But once I select it as a unit, to produce scale, as I talk about in chapter two, um, then it's no longer arbitrary, okay? And in fact, the reason it no longer becomes arbitrary is that we have to hold ourselves to that measure. The measure that then is going to be, as I'm gonna talk about in a minute, about our observation and, uh, and, and being able to trace it. So it's no longer arbitrary, okay? Um, but it is important that it's derived from a non-scalar meter human life world because what it then does is allow us to extend that measure through its consistency beyond human phenomenal, phenomenal experiential range, right? Like I could take this cell phone and we could talk about the cell phone as a, as a unit, you know, DeCalio's cell phone as a new unit. Um, and I could cut it up a million times and then use that to, to, to trace out what scale we're talking about. Uh, sure, that would be fine. But, you know, we have the meter. The meter works really well, especially because of its uh, um, powers of 10 for, uh, form. Uh, as opposed to say the imperial system, okay? Uh, and that actually allows us to do this extension beyond uh, the human phenomenal ex experiential range, okay? Um, and this is also, because I know someone mentioned it in Zach's talk, what allows us to extend these questions beyond the visual? Even though our interface, right? I mean, what I'm talking about here is even more visual in certain ways than Zach is talking about, right? Um, uh, but again, it's a thought experiment. And I would, and I would say that like, even if you don't, consider these differences in terms of vision, right? Neutron detectors, for instance, right? Or uh, protein crystallography uh, or gamma radiation scans of, of dark matter, something like that, right? Uh, no, that aren't really visual in, in a real sense. Uh, nonetheless, require this kind of reference so that we can understand at what level those differences of neutrinos are making a difference, right? They don't make a difference at the scale of the planet, for instance, okay? There's also, there's a kind of philosophy of technology question that enters here, right? That, that uh, what these other apparatuses do, even neutrino detectors, protein crystallography, and so on, is provide systematic and traceable distortions in the perceiving apparatus, such that we can then insert scalar references to understand at what size range we are handling the cosmos, okay? And again, it's super important, perhaps the most important point, that it's transformations in observation not objects, as in Gulliver scaling. Let's, let's, let's separate this out a little bit more by talking a few, about a few corollaries here, right? What objects appear rely on the scale of observation. Now, this is really significant, right? Because if you're gonna view the world at a nanometer scale, like, I mean, let's, let's, this is why we, we wouldn't do it in our interface, right? Because you can imagine here, okay, let's go down to the nanometer scale. What's, what's able to appear there is not going to be cells. It's gonna be atoms and other kinds of relations like that. Okay, and then if we go up to the terameter scale, what's going to be visible there? Different ones, right? So what objects appear to be seen and, and observed and worked with rely on the scale of observation. And it's absolutely important. Again, we haven't touched that time dial. We haven't done anything to these objects. No time has passed. Yet we've transformed the reality several times over. That seems to me really interesting. And I have some thoughts about causality there that's in chapter six. I'm not going to really cover now. Um, but it's, it's important here that then what we want to say to kind of summarize this is that you are observing your observation of an object, not an object itself, right? Which is why we don't get to this theory of scale itself if we're really interested first and foremost in these objects, right? Because what, we're, what, what scale is marking and making sense of is your observation of that object first. Now, scale is not the only one. Uh, it's not the only aspect of, uh, that does this, but it certainly is a crucial one um, uh, that I, as, I, as I think, you know, Zach and I both uh, have, have tried to make clear for you guys, okay? All right, so those are kind of the initial observations. Uh, let's then 
insert some of those limits and artifices of the scalar simulation because they again are very instructive. So number one, it would have to be the whole universe. Okay. Uh, well, right, because uh, because simulations necessarily compress the amount of information that is available and and you know the, you can just like google earth is never going to be able to include every single object at the scale of the planet right let alone also every single cell also every single atom uh, there's essentially no room to then model that so it's an incredible artifice that we're imagining that like it could sit at a computer screen and just like a google earth zoom around sorry i'm going to use, stop using the word zoom uh go larger and smaller move around uh that it's as information dense as the universe as i as i said in the initial premise but see here's where we can start to make some observations about scale and mediation right first of all you know no, i don't need to convince any of you of this right it's an obvious point that models condense the universe but scale adds an extra layer of this by saying well like look isn't there a way in which there's a kind of scalar way in which uh, there's, a, there's a relationship between that condensing and the scale at which we decide to describe something, right? Like, like uh, so in chapter three, I talk a lot about like all bats. We can make sense of bats as a category by essentially grouping all of them together and seeing common elements that may or may not apply to any given bat. Okay, and that's where there's, you know, maybe we could pause on that later and say, because that's where I think this question about me reading a book versus like text circulating at the scale of the planet start to become an issue uh, or a way of making or, you know starting to think about how scale uh, helps us think about those okay um uh right but but just to, to stick here in terms of of thinking about what it does to our observation experience if we add a thoroughly scale picture there's no space to consolidate in any way since we include all the differences available at any scale right because you just have to change the scale again and you're there Right, you're oh now I, now everything that's that I'm not seeing in this room that's like air, right? Which which this, so then, so now I'm already getting to the next point, right? That there's an implication for perception here, right? This is why the meter uh, human life world is non-scalar and tied to a particular scale at the same time, right? Uh, and I'm happy to elaborate why I say our normal experience of the world is non-scalar. We have to generate a scalar view of the world. Um, I would argue. But, but you know, here we can just pause and say any given, any perception of any given scale in a certain sense leaves out all the others since they're not relevant at that scale. Okay. Again, kind of a provocative statement, lots to be entangled there. I get, I'm covering an enormous amount of territory super quickly. This is why, you know, part one is a series of algorithms of sorts. And then the rest of the book really tries to spend more time talking about it. Um, because the point of this notion of the scale of simulation is to say, but like, look, we're going to include all relevant differences, both within any given scale and across all of them. So, so that we could say, oh, even though at the meter scale, I don't see air, I only feel it sometimes of like breathing, um, right, when it's able to make a difference at this scale, we could then change scale down to the nanometer and see like, oh, look, there's other molecules in this space that I, my, my visual field edits out. Okay. Now, the second set here is super important because of the issue that Zach already pointed to, which is that you are not outside of it, okay? And I completely agree, right? I mean, this is, uh, this is something I had to grapple with uh, very intensely because uh, you know, so many of the narratives uh, and critiques of scale come out of uh, Donna Haraway's situated knowledges and the idea of the God trick, right? And so it's very important that we're not outside of it, of course, right? But a few, a few caveats to that, right? We could still conceptualize objectivity as something like a systematic traceable specification of any given observation, not being outside of it, okay? Uh, sure, we can do that. Um, and in fact, I talk about that a lot in chapter uh, uh, 10, which is about science, okay? Um, uh, but there's a couple other things we wanna, like reasons we wanna really emphasize this is that uh, here's one of the most important ones, you, as body have not changed scales, okay? Now we have radically transformed ourselves, right? In that provocation, but that doesn't mean that Josh DiCaglio gets to suddenly be cells, right? I don't, like, if I'm gonna resolve this object again, right? Then I have now resolved this object again and its relationship to cells requires that scalar shift, right? Uh, and so this is why, you know, from my perspective, the critiques of sort of uh, the view from above 
say in the dream of Scipio that, that Zach mentioned, uh, people have, have brought that to bear on uh, sort of rhetoric around space travel, for instance, um, is less of an issue as long as we remember that like the astronaut, Elon Musk, can never change scales. Elon Musk can never change scales, even though we would love, he would love to think he has, right? He's made the difference in the world. I call this the scalar synecdoche uh, in chapter nine. Um, you have not changed scales. You cannot change scales, um, nor can any other object, okay? So this is really important. Observation of other scales doesn't equal intervention at those scales. Doesn't mean we don't intervene at other scales, but there has to be some kind of scalar translation that has to occur uh, across the, that scalar threshold, okay? And, and here's the way to state it most axiomatically. You and any given object can only act at the scale at which you exist, okay? But at the same time, we see and come to actually intervene in things like DNA, virus, viral molecules, and so on and so on. Um, and so what happens as we develop modes of re-differentiating the world into these other scales, Tracing them out in these scalar relations is that we produce these kind of situated dislocations that we say that we have experiences that are situated partially and most, but most importantly, by the scale, uh, the marker of scale. Um, but it's also really important that it's a dislocation for the same reason, actually, that Donna Haraway critiques the view from above. We want to actually say it is a dislocation, which is to say, I am not able to change the world. I am not able, you know, insofar as I as an object uh, at the meter scale, am not able to, to change cells directly. Although it's really interesting, right? Because again, as we go within experience, without experience, because like this is changing cells, but in what way, right? This is, this is to sit with that kind of disorientation as a situated dislocation, okay? Now, these other ones are less important for the sake of, I think, what I want to talk about next. So I'm going to brush through them a little bit quickly. Uh, but it's important to note that experience and information can't be seen in our interface. Um, so, you know, and because scale is about observation, we don't want to leave out experience. Um, and, and actually, uh, if we were going to try to like use the interface to figure out what's going to happen next at any given moment in it, you would need some kind of account of information and experience um, and some kind of semiotics or information. This is where I'm actually betraying the fact that I'm trained as a rhetorician uh, in, in sort of philosophy of language first and foremost. And that's why I have this next project that, you know, I needed to write this book on scale to figure out something about what scale was. Uh, but there's so many questions left to be said about what then information is in the scalar schematic, okay? Um, and, uh, and there's also a relationship here to these other concepts of like pattern emergence systems, et cetera, which inevitably emerge when we start to talk about scale, okay? This one's actually gonna be more important, I think, to most people viewing this, which is that, uh, you know, I, I want to acknowledge that there could be other ways of rendering the world. Like we can imagine adding more filters to our interface uh, so that we see, you know, other ways of rendering other than our normal sort of human body-based visual um, uh, uh, at any given scale, right? Uh, but it's, it is an artifice and, and that's part of why we're just playing with it here um, because, be, but, but ultimately, like the answer to, to, to this, like, why does it matter? I guess I should say this, okay? Uh, that it's not necessarily norm to a human or able-bodied experience, experience. And that this is not as big of an issue as it initially appears, since these scales rely uh, on limits and ranges of both differentiation and interactability. So as an example, a cell and a microbe, you know, we might be able to look at like a given cell and a microbe and say, hey, they experience in this kind of umwelt or life world kind of way, different things, right? So they, they experience diff that, that scale differently, but, they, but scale nonetheless still relates to the range at which they will have certain differences able to make a difference for them at that scale, okay? Now, I know there's a lot of conceptual leaps happening there, uh, but, but this is part of what I'm trying to play with and thinking about what scale has done in tracing these domains of differentiation, okay? All right, so I am at 52 minutes. Okay, great, so I've got about eight minutes to talk through. Let's play with the interface. I just spent all that time imagining this interface, talking about its limits. Let's play with it for a minute, okay? Uh, and I'm only gonna cover the first kind of question, which is what is, let's pick an object, right? Uh, for example, because it's more interesting, because like, you know, we could talk about what's this glass, but let's go ahead to a cell, 
okay, since that seems to be the, the example that is easiest to go to. Uh, so let's talk about what's a cell. Here we are in the interface. Well, okay, no, clearly we have to actually change to the other scale. So we're gonna scale down in our, uh, um, scale to the smaller in our, with our controls there, go down to the cell and just notice, hey, we needed to select the right scale in order to talk about what a cell is, okay? Which is to say, to make this more significant in relation to questions about mediation and representation, that both objects and representations are scale specific. Scales are only discernible as a relevant object at the scale of the micrometer, okay? Uh, you know, likewise, just to kind of throw in this project on lithium I'm thinking about going forward, right? Lithium only becomes discernible and definable at the scale of the atom in the periodic table, even if it suddenly becomes relevant in all sorts of other ways at other scales, okay? Uh, so, right, so and again, I'm getting ahead of myself because first we have to say, Studying something as a clearly defined object is only possible when we remain at one scale, right? Insofar as we want to consider that as an object in itself as having any kind of like attributes that we want to say just have to do with this status as a cell insofar as we want to do that. Um, I, I'm actually not sure that we do, but if we want to do that, it's only possible if we stay at that scale. And yet, uh, right, so we don't, want to, we don't want to go to these other scales to think about that. And yet, once selected, once we select that object and say okay we, we you know at the at the micro scale we keep seeing these cells in these bodies uh, uh see and i've already skipped scales there but you know hey we're here we're zooming in hey look at all these cells what are these okay then we can start to trade to to chart it at that scale we can do this kind of thing uh which of course is what we can get taught in science here's a, a neuron and here's all the aspects of it we got ribosomes we got golgi apparatus we got nucleus right we have all these different parts okay so we can start to do that at that scale okay and yet we can also try to relate it to these other scale objects right and this is why it's fun to think about this in relation to this interface right because you could imagine zooming into this object here finding neurons and then zooming back out and i said i was going to stop using the word zoom but it's hard to right uh we're going to scale back up uh scale back to the larger and say oh look that's a brain Ooh, these particular kinds of cells are they seem to only appear in these larger scale objects called brains so it's interesting right because then we already have terms that do this right and and in fact this is i i was thinking about this a lot with some of the conversations we had earlier right that that uh, brain cell already encodes across these, these different scales, right? Um, so some of what we were talking about in terms of cross-scalar relations or simultaneity, the, the, one of the first things that we should note there is that we already basically cross those scales when we use a term like brain cell, right? Um, so uh, I keep thinking about how our political discourse is doing this constantly, talking about things that humans do at the meter scale already in terms of their larger scale effects, okay? So we're already encoding across scales when we talk about something as a brain cell. Uh, and there's great reason for doing that, but we have to acknowledge, that's why, that's why one and two are so important, right? Because we're acknowledging that we're relating two things at two different scales together and trying to understand one in relation to the other scale, okay? Um, and and in, in doing this selection, we have to, this is why then we have to remember to keep in view the scale at which we are examining an object, right? We have to understand that the aspects of relevance as brain are not the same as the aspects of relevance as cell, and that there's actually a translation that has to happen that are different levels of difference that are being inserted at any given moment, okay? Now, it's really essential actually that um, any given object, and here we can actually switch from cells to water because it's easier with non living examples, that uh, any object might require a change or a specification of scales of relevance. So it's just to elaborate more of what I was just saying. For instance, take water, right? We know that the, the significant chemical component of water is this H2O molecule. And yet, if we're talking about mo the, that molecule at the scale of the meter, we get something like water, right? And it's important in all of the valences that we have in relation to water. If we talk about it in relation to the micro scale, we would then talk about its relationship to the production of life and the necess its necessary um, presence for moving molecules around at that scale, all right? If we were to talk about it in terms of the planet, right, we can see actually three different forms of water here as clouds, uh, uh, glaciers, and, and oceans, right? Uh, that's very different, yet it's the same object, very importantly, right? 
that we then define at the nanometer here, uh, and this is actually a, a, a micro microscopic uh, um, scan of a, of a chain of, of H2O molecules, okay? Um, and all of that's to say that we are acknowledging that there's a change or specification of the scales of relevance, right? That water as glacier movement is to change the, the scale of relevance, right? Um, that then will apply differently. My, you know, if we do an environmental uh, uh, version of this, it's interesting to me that carbon, if you're going to say carbon, right? Carbon is like the fundamental molecule of life. And yet, if you say carbon to most people uh, uh, these days, right, they're not going to think about that. They're going to think about climate change, right? Uh, so at the scale of the planet, carbon becomes relevant in a different way than at the scale of, uh, uh, of the micrometer and the, the nanometer where life gets going, okay? And all that's kind of can be wrapped up here, as I'm already pointing to with that climate example, uh, carbon example, is that we're, it's often wrapped up in these values and assumptions that is derived from another scale. So this is one of the values of this kind of scalar schematic. This is why I, I often say that the consistency of scale, the reason we hold ourselves to it is because it, it permits us to actually test and undermine often many of our human assumptions because scale already is viewing the world outside of the way that humans view it, usually, right? Uh, and again, I mean, there's, the, the norming there is made possible by the fact that the meter scale is the way that we experience the world um, and we don't leave it, right? And so, so this permits us to actually sort out in a certain way, like these assumptions that we make and these values that we insert at these different scales and, and be clearer about what we're talking about and how we insert those values in any given moment, right? So that we can say, for instance, here's the coronavirus, right? We don't want to see that anymore. Uh, but like, in, let's give a, a particular example. And I realize I'm about out of time here. Yeah, um, uh, because because uh, there's more practical versions of that, like the climate one with carbon, but like as kind of a bigger conceptual one, right? Like if we talk about what is included in the body or not, or what's living or non-living in our interface, right? Like we're in the interface, we're playing with it. And we're saying, hey, there seems to be certain systems that are alive and certain systems that aren't, right? At the nanometer, you can separate out, oh, these viruses, they're not living because they're just, you know, re reactive molecules. Um, and so in relation to this kind of molecular scale and, the, and the, the micrometer scale, you can separate them out. Hey, this one's not living, but this one is. But then the strange thing, right, is that then things that we would say are not alive are clearly within this system, right? There's bacteria there. I mean, bones, right, are basically rocks that have been arranged within this body. Are you telling me that this bone is not alive, right? And we're like, well, but I wouldn't say your bones are alive, right? But you see how what I'm pointing to is that we've, we have to make choices then. Of like there's, it's putting pressure on our notion of life, right? Uh, to do that kind of thing, right? Uh, and uh, you know, I think it then becomes really significant then, a la the bone example, to then say, well then, what would we say is life at the scale of the planet? What does life look like at the scale of the planet? As say the astrophysicists at NASA have been trying to do for the last 50 years, what would it, what would it look like from, uh, from uh, uh, that, that kind of scale? Uh, then, then it seems more significant than that you get uh, conceptions of Gaia or, um, or the, you know, Vernadsky's notion of the biosphere or Tiho de Chardin's notion of, of the noosphere in relation to the biosphere. These kind of ideas become more interesting when you think about the fact that depending on the scale that you select, you get different perspectives of life. And so even though we don't want to include rocks and our cars as part of life on the planet, right? If we were to do the same thing to our bodies, like do we not include our bones, right? Like, you know, right? So I, I'm not making any definitive conclusions about that, but I'm noting the way in which scale helps us think more clearly about these things as we think about under what conditions do we insert these criteria at these given scales? Does that make sense? Okay, so summary. We have to remember, and, and you know, I get this is all very theoretical, um, so I'm happy to try to give some more practical examples if you'd like, uh, but we're remembering that scale requires a careful tracing of where we're observing and when, noting how we make those differences discernible, and I haven't really talked that much about that in relation to like how science does it, um, while we note when and how we insert our values and assumptions into those pictures, understanding that's not necessarily a problem, uh, 
But the important thing is that there's a transformation in our own life world, our way of speaking and our modes of, of thinking. In fact, as I like to say, we already have when we start to talk about coronaviruses. And that's where this last point, I think, I would be remiss not to finish with, which is that part of what those limits of the interface, like even if that, okay, even if that interface was possible, it's not like we could ever have enough time to really know what is going on in my body, for instance. I just want to understand my body. At what scale would I, would I go to, right? And even if I understood cells really well, there's still a couple, you know, trillion more of them, let alone uh, however many more atoms to understand. And I could go and start to look at the ecological relations, which I can't separate out from them at that scale, right? There's always more to any given description encounter or mode of knowing than any description can, can provide. And so the key for me in all of this in, in sitting with these transformation at scale is just is to start and end with this fact that it's all disorienting. And that acknowledgement, of, while it may seem like a kind of, you know, shrug at some point, uh, is, is actually, I think, a necessary starting point and again, ending point too, because it is an acknowledgement of the fact that there's this incredible reorientation brought by this new scalar view of the cosmos. And it's only in sitting with that that we'll start to unravel because scale has already unraveled us, all of these assumptions that we have about the way that the world works, the way that action works, what you can do, what it means to be here in this planet, doing things uh, as a body at the meter scale, okay? All right, there's image credits for the uh, copyright gods. Uh, and there again is the uh, code if you want to give it a shot. And there's me. Or there's me. Sorry. Um, there's 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 the the scale of relevance, right? All right. I'm Josh Chicalio. Uh, love to be in touch uh, and uh, happy to hear your questions. Thank you so much, Josh. That, that was that was incredible, and your enthusiasm is also so infectious. I feel so excited about scale, even if I wasn't uh, that excited before. Um, uh, it's really just added to, yeah. You use so much enthusiasm. That, 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 that's really Thank fantastic. You. Um, so, but, but we, before we we sort of started this, we were having a little chat about about the idea of. Um, sort of slightly more concrete examples, you're like, oh, you know, you keep mentioning theory. And so perhaps whether, whether you could just speak briefly, and I think you sort of started to touch it upon the, at the end, and you sort of mentioned it in the sixth part, is perhaps the, the question of causality. So, you know, when we think about climate change, we think about epidemics or pandemics, um, and this issue of kind of sources, origins, what, what, what do we do about this and any kind of intervention or action, you know, the, the, the question of causality kind of comes up at this point. And so I was wondering whether you could just talk a little bit about that um, in, if it's not too disorienting um, as, as, a, as a concept to, to grapple with in this case. Yeah, I see, and, and you're tempting me with a concrete, to go to a concrete example, but there's a really great kind of theoretical point that I don't really know what to do with. There's a lot of things that happen in this book that I don't really know what to do with. Maybe you guys do. Um, which is that in that sort of scalar simulation, it could make us think that, realize that certain things that we render as causality are incorrectly rendered so, right? That they're actually scale shifts, right? Like, in, in fact, there, a, a, another choice has to be made, right? So am I depressed because there is not enough dopamine in my brain, or is there not enough dopamine in my brain because I'm depressed, right? Well, wrong question, because those are two different scales of looking at the same thing. Okay, right. It's only if you have an, a, a, a desired intervention in mind, right? Sorry to use a pun, uh, to that, that you would then say, okay, we could intervene by taking a medication to alter the dopamine, or we could intervene by, I don't know, giving you a million dollars and making you happy, right? Or no, 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 of course, right. But then one might be ineffective, right? And that's, and I realize that the that a mental health one is really difficult, but I use a like uh, medical ones because because there there's like a, a, a reason to select the scale, right? So I, I use the example of like meningitis, right? Like, it, you know, at what scale do we want to go to, right? And, and uh, you know, it, it makes us kind of realize that, oh, what Pasteur really did then was locate the significant difference for a majority of disease at the scale of the micro. Ooh, that's really interesting, right? And so there is a causal chain that's cross-scalar there um, that's made possible. And yet, you know, 
you know, it, 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 it's, you can see many times uh, that we, that we don't, that we insert causality too quickly or incorrectly. Right. But let's get, let's get to the, the, the more sort of concrete because, because, uh, because, I mean, I guess maybe this isn't an answer about causality then, but it has to do with scale relations, right? Because even though I'm really emphatic, and I think it's, it's essential to the whole project to, to distinguish scale domains, right? That nonetheless, something like scale relations are and do happen. In fact, they are happening, right? That is what's happening here. They're, of course, because it's the same thing viewed in different ways. So of course it is, right? So it seems to me that what we are struggling with is the fact that we are actually, we have become very effective at scalar intervention, right? It's not that we need to be able to do it better. We need to understand what we're doing, right? <laughs> like, like we are collectively intervening at the planetary scale and at the, you know, molecular scale with DNA and with toxic molecules and like, like, yeah, because it turns out that we can make differences happen in certain ways at those levels, okay? Uh, but that's where we need to get even more careful about what it is we're talking about and when, right? And I think so much of the critiques of scale that we've already heard uh, uh, from some of the others, and I'm sure we'll keep hearing, have to do with this kind of, uh, what I would call it, an elision of scale, right? Uh, that, that misses that fundamental point that you never actually change scale, right? That, is, that to me is the, the God trick, right? So that's why in that article, I call it scale tricks and God tricks, uh, right? Because it's a God trick as a scale trick. Right, that we just kind of oh, suddenly I I am you know Richard Feynman reaching down into the nanoscale with these slave hands, uh, or or whatever it is. Okay, uh, so, so maybe you're familiar with that example. So it seems to me that then what this makes possible, and this is what kind of the next project is, uh, it, because people keep asking me about this, is is to say okay, well like look great yeah we can select an object let's let's select one that's really important lithium right or something like that. And I I happen to have these like personal connections to lithium because my father actually was uh, an engineer who helped develop one of the uh, original lithium batteries. Um, and, uh, and we can select an object like that, see where it's actually significant, and then start to trace out how it then makes itself known at different scales in different ways and creates all sorts of things that extend beyond its just particular attributes at the nanoscale, but that are also related to its attributes at the nanoscale, right? The reason that we are all mining lithium is because at the, you know, at the atomic level, it is the ideal molecule for storing and transferring energy. Of course, that also is why it's the most, it's volatile and will blow up in water, um, you know, right? Because it's good at storing energy and then making it happen, right? Um, uh, right, but that also is then connected up in the geological reasons why it appears in certain places, which also happen to connect up with with uh, geopolitical reasons why those places tend to be where indigenous people uh, are, are wondering why these, uh, these people are coming and mining on their lands, right? Like, and so suddenly the scale or object finds itself entangled in all these different levels of action and intervention that just, you know, that trying to address one scale problem, climate change or ecological transition, uh, we then, you know, find ourselves entangled in these other scalar relations, right? It seems to me a really good case study for trying to think about, you know, what, it, like, how do we sort that all out, right? And not just get lost, right? Because, because to me, this is all very practical because it's all about what are we even talking about, right? You start talking about lithium. Are you talking about these molecules? Are you talking about batteries? Are you talking about this multinational corporation? Are you talking about Elon Musk? Please, let's, let's stop talking about Elon Musk, right? Uh, okay, yeah. Yeah, I see, I see, yeah. Um I got so excited and jumped in with my question. I forgot to ask everyone, if you have questions, please put them down um, in the Q&A box. Um, Josh, you, you mentioned at the beginning that you didn't want to talk about mysticism, but we do actually have a question uh, from Yasgan, okay. who you've, you've mentioned a few times so far about mysticism. I'll just read it out for you. If you want to read it, I think you can just click on the Q&A box as well. Okay. So for everyone else, um, other scales are jarring and somewhat ineffable within the te uh, terminology of mesoscale. How do we and why do we distinguish this sense of ineffability caused by scale from ineffability caused by other complex things unrelated to scale? And then isn't mysticism, psychedelic experience or mindfulness, just an ineffable experience that creates an illusion of access to other scales? Generally, can you speak a bit more about mysticism? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, son. And I, and I have to say, you know, I really appreciate your presentation. I think you mentioned this was one of your first presentations you did. Absolutely terrific. Uh, and this is I a agree. great question. Um, yeah. Uh, 
So welcome. Uh, and uh, yeah, so uh, the jarring and the ineffable is part of the deal, right? That's why, you know, uh, when I talk about scale domains, it's about that radical shift where suddenly you're like, wait, I'm no longer viewing myself as, right? I'm a series of semi-autonomous organisms coordinating together in a really complex way. And I don't even understand that they're there, right? So if you want, you know, if you want that dose of that in science is, you know, I think many, many people in the humanities have already discovered Lynn Margulis, but she was, you know, Lynn Margulis and her son Dorian Sagan were the ones that uh, kind of got me thinking about this, you know, over a decade ago. Um, yeah, so, so there's, a, there's a sort of craziness there. Um, but we should nitpick a little bit on this notion of ineffability because it has to do with, with a kind of philosophy of language, right? That I would say that like, hey, actually it's not in a certain way ineffable, even though it is, right? Because what you're saying is, is that it's radically reorienting what it is we mean by anything, right? So the word cell, is it referring to these, right? Right, there's already this kind of issue, right? So there's a kind of not knowing, I, I, so the kind of axiomatic way I talk about it in chapter 10 is that science encodes a not knowing within a knowing, right? Because it defines something like a cell, tells you all sorts of amazing things about it with incredible detail that's really useful for all sorts of explanations. And yet, has it explained what's going on right here? I mean, both yes and no, right? But it's done that by a, a kind of compression, right? Um, it's, 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 uh, yeah, it's, it, there's a kind of compression there. Uh, in relation to your, your invocation of psychedelic experience, I should actually just kind of tip my hat to my uh, dissertation advisor who let me do this crazy project. Because if you haven't read his work, uh, his name is Richard Doyle. He has a book called Darwin's Pharmacy that's about psychedelics and these very problems uh, in relation to ecology, okay? Um, and in fact, he was, once I, once I realized that there was all this kind of mysticism connection, he was the one who was like, okay, well, here are the like, you know, things you need to do and read, okay? Um, do and, and, you know, mindfulness and meditation kind of thing, but read also engaging with the history of, of actual text, text on mysticism, okay? Um, let's see, did I cover all the parts there? Um, oh, yeah. the illusion of access, the illusion of access. Mm -hmm. I want to say, like, be careful, right? Because because in a certain way, you do access them because they are also you, right? Now, there's where, you know, hey, DiCaglio, you're getting rather mystical there, right? That is the Tatva Masi from the Vedic tradition, right? You are that. We are a way for the cosmos to know itself. Oh, sorry, that was Carl Sagan. Um, but like, you know, uh, right? Tatva Masi, thou art that, is the, the sense in which you access them, right? But there, the, the problem is you, right? You know, this body right here is not accessing them. But because it is me in a certain sense, right? You gotta be careful there, right? That it, right? Like at what scale? So this is, you're, you're getting me into to chapter 10, uh, sorry, chapter eight, which is about subjects, right? So this is the provocation. This is where we, where we go with this question about subjects uh, is mm -hmm. it's related to this question about illusion of access. Um, and, uh, and, and so on the one hand, no, you don't access other scales. You only act at the scale at which you exist. But in another sense, you are already that. We are already ecological relations, right? That is mm -hmm. viewing the world, the cosmos from a different perspective. And that it seems is really important for then uh, both, well, I mean, for this immediate question of, oh, how does this relate to mysticism? But for the more sort of relevant question of say, you know, ecological relations, like you are already mm -hmm. those, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and does that link sort of more directly to this idea you talked about about the living and the non-living because i well you know what well, like we talk about the idea of like a calcium atom generally we think not living in a bone living but then with, like with the carbon it kind of you can have this move from living to non-living to non to living depending on how we're looking at it and d does that kind of figure into how you think about say something like if we're, if i keep want to bringing back to things like climate change or something but right like, does that, is that something that you connect to mysticism or is that a slightly separate thing within your way of thinking? I, of I think that, I think that mysticism has been working with this basic difficulty for a very long time. If you, if you, you know, if you don't just say, oh, my, you know, mystics and you actually, you know, take a look at somebody like Pseudodionysius, you know, and, and you, and, you know, there's, there's, there's ways in which I'm, I, you know, I, I do engage with and acknowledge the history of, of, critiques of the, the notion of mysticism and say, look, no, there's something very, very useful here if we define mysticism as an encounter with an attempt to integrate yourself with this kind of scalar schematic, especially the easiest form of access, not that it's easy, is larger scales, 
right? Um, and in fact, this is one of the ways I, I was thinking in uh, Sarah and Christian's panel about how actually part of the problem is that we've had various scalar, especially ecological narratives that was in certain sense, the, the genre of the, the epic, right? The Bhagavad Gita, uh, the Mahabharata, right? It's both giant, but also at the core of it is that cosmic vision of Arjuna, right? Um, uh, you know, a, a, in which one exceeds the scale of your existence glimpses the whole you know the, the multifarious forms and returns to your scale and goes okay uh so uh what was that <laughs> what do we do with that right um and that actually uh, as i talk about in the book creates the need for scale just as much as say going to space or something like that or seeing a cell right and so then but but see this is what's interesting to me right it, I, you know especially as somebody who first and foremost studied rhetoric is in what cases and in what instances does that actually persuade us Right. It seems to me that those mystics have been dealing with that problem for as long as there has been any articulation like this. Right. What we're experiencing now as like, how do we like, oh, my God, we see that we affect the planet that in a certain sense, we are the planet. And because there's a lot of us, we suddenly have these we're changing the planet. And then we come back down to this scale and we're like, OK, so what was that? How do we do, like how does that actually persuade us to live any differently? Mm, yeah. And, and how does that speak to the question of like political agency or, or social change you know like you talked about um so look uh, you said something this idea of like within politics we're often encoding uh, across scales you know so i presume you're talking about like i don't know recycle and you'll save the planet or you know there's this kind of idea that we're already encoding uh, sort of different scales within political action right. but at the same time you have this idea of like you know, I am a human, but not all humans. So we have these kind right. of like contradictions that are kind of constantly sort of um, in place when we're trying yeah. to work out what, how to live life, how, what to do, what does, what does it mean for me to do X? Yeah, and, and I mean, really, I mean, the, the first answer to that is really just like an incredible humility, right? Which is that like, I don't actually know how to change the world, right? <laughs> and like, and like, it seems, it's funny that like, it seems like that is not an appropriately ethical position these days. And maybe, maybe it is, I don't know, but like everybody wants to change the world and you've got to get involved, right? But I don't actually know how to change the world, right? And that's, mm. and, and um, you know, so I, I mentioned that at the point where I was talking about brain cells, right? Because, mm. because it seems to me that like, I just like, I, like, I don't really know what my relationship is to cells, uh, even though I know a lot about cells, um, it's, it seems to me that we, we have to be doing the same kind of problems in relation to politics. And, and by the way, like, you know, just as a historical note, I, I, was, I, I first developed the idea for this, you know, what was originally a dissertation while participating in Occupy Wall Street in, what was that, 2011, right? And so, and, and it was specifically the ways in which there were these casual scale shifts and like kind of selective scaling that was happening in order to completely dismiss anybody doing anything. <laughs> it was like, and right, so it's not that I haven't been thinking about politics, it's that, it's that I think that we need to have a, just as much bewilderment about politics as we do about, say, cells here, right? Because I think that politics can be a kind of version of this kind of reinsertion of the human at the very moment that we say we're getting beyond the human. And like, this is honestly my reading of Richard Powers uh, to you know, speak to Christian's talk specifically is that like like where it gets problematic is that is that he's he's always insistently and, and too early <laughs> inserting this kind of political framework over it and then you know and then i think we were seeing this as well in uh and sarah's talking about the critiques of that novel right that like you know hey what does this do right to what extent will it make a difference and it's like but like it seems to me that because we can see all of these scalar indicators right uh, this is where I, you know, am definitely on board with Zach and the problem of big data, right? Is that we get all these scalar indicators of things like racism and and uh, and inequality of, of various sorts and viruses and the, like, there's all these scalar indicators, but it doesn't necessarily give us information about the relationship between what I'm doing here, right? Like, what do I have to do today, <laughs> right? Like, I got to give a talk and then I got to go pick up my kids and then I get ready. Like, it doesn't necessarily give us information about the relationship between those and this. So you get this trope of nothing I do will matter is actually a scalar synecdoche, right? And in fact, I think that nothing serves current political 
uh, machinations more than us constantly being like, me taking care of my meter scale reality is not worthwhile because I have all these indicators of other scales of effects, right? Uh, and so therefore, right? And so then we're all paying attention to, the, to, to these kind of large scale indicators uh, and failing to attend to the scale at which we experience. Right. Uh, it seems to me a very important kind of implication here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, I think that's a really good. It's, it is this temptation. And I suppose one of the one of the sort of impulses behind this conference was to try and think through these ideas. But I suppose we've got to be careful about sort of jumping, uh, running before we can walk on, on, on those kind of questions. I suppose perhaps I think that I don't think there are any questions uh, that are coming through. So I was wondering whether you could perhaps talk a little bit about your lithium project. You mentioned that you you sort of, this is a kind of uh, something that, not an addenda, but a kind of sequel of sorts, a kind of thinking through of some of the ideas that you didn't feel you were able to think through in this current yeah. book. And would you like to sort of speak a little to, to, to that? Yeah, so I mean, first of all, I should say, the actual sequel of this would be doing the same thing that I did with scale to the notion of information which is what that other project was. That was what I was thought I was going to do next. But then what happened is that, you know, I, I've been, I've, I have a couple of side publications uh, thinking about scale and environmentalism. Uh, and I think, you know, Zach, I, I also appreciate your things that you've written about uh, in this front too. I think there's a lot more to be said on this front, right? I mean, most of the things cited in the other talks earlier were uh, people thinking about environmental issues, right? Um, and so it, it seems to me that, you know, it's more of a like a side project, you know, kind of instantiation, heaven forbid, an application of, <laughs> of the things that I've, that I've been doing, um, it, you know, partially to speak to some of these kind of methodological issues, both in science and technology studies and these other sort of humanities fields. Um, but it's also to, as an experiment, that's why I was calling it a kind of experiment in scale, um, as an experiment of saying like, okay, so, let's do more of this tracing and see then what does it push us to, to think differently? Um, because if, if the basic thesis is right, that there's an enormous reorientation that we're just catching up to, right? The fact of the matter is that even though I would say mystics have been acknowledging the rhetorical difficulty for thousands of years, it's like we're only now realizing that there's something really big here that we need to reorient ourselves to. And yet we're like, oh, like, let's just get beyond the human all right, you're bound the human, I'm bound the human, we know we want to be, you know, and, and like it's done, right? Meanwhile, you know, this is to bring it back to the kind of contemplative, is that like, well, contemplatives are like, well, like, you probably need to sit and observe yourself for a decade, because you have no idea all the assumptions and forms that are already embedded in your neurons, right? So this is what chapter 12 is about, right? So how then uh, is it possible? Because like, I feel like scale theory was really about, you know, each of us individually, this is how I view theory, right? Theory as a way of viewing is a kind of careful dissection and examination of the way in which we've constructed reality, right? So then it seems to me that once we've done that examination, we could say, okay, great. Like now let's take an object. You say that it changes our relationship to, to, to uh, you know, the, the planet. Well, let's do that, right? Um, and so, you know, and I could have chosen like carbon, right? I could have talked about climate change, right? Although I, I really, as just a side note, don't really like our obsession with climate change because like, I mean, as far as scale of the planet goes, we're changing so many things, right? Uh, that's why I like, you know, I've been playing around using the term like ecological realignment or something like that, right? That like, like we are ecological transformation. We are radically transforming the entire attributes of the planet, right? Uh, and yet we fixated on this one indicator of carbon, mm. right? As if like not all the other ones also matter, right? Uh, we may throw in a couple like you know, extinct species, but that's that's precisely the point, right? So the point is to say, okay, great, let's pick up this one object and and consider how we can follow it through. So they like trace through all the different scales and relations, and when when are we talking about it at one scale? When are we talking about it at another scale? How does one condition of say the geological formations that makes make lithium appear? How does that then relate to the geopolitical? Uh, formations relate, you know, how does that then relate to, like, how does the chemistry of the battery relate to, right? Like, that there's actually mm -hmm. these things are related, and it seems to me that we need to acknowledge all of those things to help us understand all of the, to use Gregory Bateson's term, uh, the double binds, right, that we find ourselves in with environmentalism can actually be traced, right? Because, you know, in our kind of ability to render virtual, uh, to use the term Zach's already been using, uh, these kind of scale changes, 
We just imagine that if we all get together and say, let's build an environmentally sustainable reality that like somehow tomorrow we're all going to do it. But of course it's, it's right. Like the, the entire scale of realignment required to do that, of course has to be immense. Just like the immensity of the operation that was required for us to mess it up to begin with. Right. <laughs> so far as you want to say, you know, uh, judge it as a, as a mess up. Right. So yeah. You, so you see the kind of premise there. Mm -hmm. No, I yeah. mean, honestly, with COVID and everything, you know, even though I've had this like in my brain for the last year and a half, I haven't gotten much further than that in terms of concept and work. So, so my hope is, you know, if any of you guys uh, want to have further conversations about this, I'm planning on presenting on it more with more detail come the end of the year at the uh, the 4S conference, uh, and I and that's in Mexico. So I'm hoping to actually get uh, do a little bit more of that, you know, applied work as you say mm -hmm. of talking to miners, uh, people in the lithium industry, and so on. Well, I think that that really is that sums so many of the, the things up uh, we want to, to be talking about. I feel like it's been a sort of masterclass of from the, the, the very small to the very big, not too many zooms, but scaling larger and, and, and smaller. Um, so thank you so much. Um, we've got a couple of comments coming in about how, how, how great your talk was. Um, so I think on behalf of everyone on here and, and certainly from me and Magdalena, uh, thank you so much for, for your presentation. Um, this will be going out um, uh, to, for, for everyone to watch uh, further afield. Um, but for, for, to, for tonight, thank you once again um, and to everyone who came to watch and we'll call it a night. So goodbye. Right, thank you guys. Thanks for your attention.